Good evening, and welcome to the Council Advisory Committee CAC meeting of the 13th of December, 2021. This meeting is being held in chambers and we are observing COVID-19 protocols. You will note that members of council are seated at their carols. Members of council are encouraged to wear their mask when not speaking. Members of staff. Reporting in progress. <laughs> All good. Members of staff and citizens are spaced around the room to ensure six feet separations. Citizens must remain in their seats unless departing the chamber or rising to speak, and they must wear their masks at all times while in the chamber. This meeting is being live streamed on Facebook Live, and the most up-to-date meeting package is on the Town of Kentville website. This meeting is called to order. Have all of the councillors received and reviewed their meeting package? Does any member of council have information pertaining to a matter before this council which has not been publicly circulated? As a council advisory committee, we will vote as a committee to either send business forward to the council meeting for ratification, return to staff for further information or review, or defeat the recommendation. I will remind members of council that we should continue to be mindful of our decision-making wheel to make balanced and respectful decisions while adhering to our code of conduct. This council through policy has adopted Robert's rules as our rules of order, our parliamentary procedure, and as the chair of the meeting, it is my responsibility to use those orders to ensure we get the business of the town done. We will be voting by electronic means for all votes except administrative. Are there any conflict of interest issues we should be aware of before the meeting commences? CAO Trope, could you please take the roll call? Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Snow. Uh, this evening we have all council present and accounted for, so we have quorum for tonight's meeting. Excellent. Thank you uh, very much. CAO, we have been provided uh, with a proposed agenda. Do you have anything to add or delete to that agenda? Uh, yes, Mayor Snow. So the first item, uh, we have an item under 6A with regards to the solicitor providing information to council. That item should be an in-camera item, so that would be 10A, uh, legal opinion. Okay. Uh, then we also have two other items that will be in camera tonight. One would be a labor issue, and so that would be 10B. And then 10C, we have uh, a legal issue with regards to land. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, did everyone uh, get those changes? So that's three additions to the in camera, and uh, you are moving uh, one item out of old business. Are there any further additions or deletions? If I could have a motion to accept. Uh, Oh, Councillor Zabian. Thank you, Mayor Snow. Um, at the last meeting uh, two weeks ago, uh, when the citizens got up to speak, they were muted at the microphone and people at home were not able to hear. And I think that you owe them an apology to the people who spoke, also to the citizens at home. Um, you control the console there as you just educated us about 10 minutes ago. Mm -hmm. um, you also owe an apology to my wife. You made accusations at her at the podium, which were highly inappropriate. And I think it would, uh, would be very nice of you to apologize for how you handled that meeting. And again, for muting people who have every right to stand up there and speak to us. We don't have to agree with what they say, but we do have to respect them and allow them to speak. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Councillor uh, Councillor Zabian. Um, it would have been an oversight uh, that I muted anybody. Typically, I turn on uh, the, uh, the, the console as, uh, as soon as people uh, start to speak. Uh, for that, I, uh, I apologize. Um, so are there any further additions uh, to the agenda? And yes, that was- you owe an apology for the accusations that you made at Marion Bay. I made no accusations. You, you accused her of lobbying, counselor, and you said she was in a conflict of interest. The last time I, I was educated, there's only one counselor in our household and you're looking at her. She's not on council. Thank you, Councillor Zabian. Are there any further uh, additions or deletions to this agenda? I would take a motion to accept the agenda. Councillor Maxwell, thank you. And the second, Councillor Gerard, thank you. All those in favor? Those opposed? The motion is carried, thank you. You have before you the minutes of the November 8th, 2021 CAC meeting. If there are no changes, the minutes are approved as distributed. If there are changes, the recording secretary will annotate uh, those minutes in red. Are there any changes? None, moving on. 
We have uh, three presentations uh, this evening, and uh, pres presenters will have 10 minutes for their presentations, followed by questions from Council. And due to the tight schedule this evening, I will cue you at the one minute mark, uh, and the mic will be turned off at the 10 minute mark. I um, want to thank all of you uh, for your presentations in advance. And we have one uh, presentation joining us uh, via Zoom. Unfortunately, uh, people watching Facebook cannot see uh, Emma Norton from the David Suzuki Foundation, but we are recording uh, the, uh, the Zoom uh, portion and it will be available on our YouTube uh, channel. Uh, so, Emma, the floor is, uh, is yours, and I'm turning on the mic in front of, uh, in front of the monitor, so uh, it's, uh, it's yours. Hello. Hello, everyone. Hello, Mayor. Hello, Councillors. Thank you so much for having me today. I should clarify, this happens all the time. I don't work with the David Suzuki Foundation. I work with the Institute. So I can be a little bit more political than the foundation because we're non-charitable. So I don't want to get the foundation in trouble with anything I ever say. Thank you. Um, thank you so much for having me tonight. I, I work on a project of the David Suzuki Institute called the Climate Emergency Unit. And what sparked the Climate Emergency Unit is the book called A Good War, written by Seth Klein, where he compares the mobilization that Canada undertook during the Second World War to the mobilization that's required for the climate crisis. So the Climate Emergency Unit, as a five-year project, is working to mobilize every level of government, municipal, provincial, federal, into climate emergency mode. I started with the Climate Emergency Unit this year. Before that, I actually worked with Quest, who I believe you're working with on a buildings retrofit um, map. Uh, in Kentville, and before that, I worked with the Ecology Action Center on their energy team. So I've been working on climate and the transition we need to make for about 10 years now. And I do want to say I'm aware that Kentville is working on a regional climate change mitigation plan, as well as that uh, buildings plan with Quest that I meant and that I already talked about. And I just want to say that's excellent and commend you for that work. I believe that we can all confidently agree that we are currently living in a climate emergency. First in BC, it was the extreme heat dome event that shattered temperature record records and robbed us of almost 600 British Columbians in less than a week this past summer. That's nearly a third as many that died in BC from COVID since the start of the pandemic. And to drive home this point, the June heat dome was the most deadly weather event in Canadian history. But most of the people who perished were isolated, lower income seniors, and their deaths were preventable. If those homes had already been unplugged from gas and converted to electric heat pump systems, which also cool in the summer, as many of you know, as, and as we urgently need to do to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, it is very likely that those people would still be with us and more heat events are coming, and one of your jobs in the coming years, I'm afraid to warn you, will be to lead us in mourning and marking those lost lives. And the heat dome was followed by hundreds of wildfires, forcing the evacuation of thousands from their homes, and most dramatically, burning the entire town of Lytton to the ground. One comment from the mayor of Lytton really hits home. I'm 60, and I thought climate change was a problem for the next generation, now I'm the mayor of a town that no longer exists. If you think that can never happen to you, think again. But the impacts have been visceral here in Nova Scotia as of late. I really miss a snowy December and a white Christmas. Saturday night passed, the temperatures reached 18 degrees Celsius in Nova Scotia in middle of December. We've had two massive lightning storms in the past week. And as I scrolled today's headlines that mentioned climate change in Nova Scotia in the same article, I read about decreased availability of Christmas trees, lobsters, and booze. So Christmas is going to look a lot different now that climate emergency is here. The Globe and Mail had an article quoting Darlene Norman, the mayor of the region of Queens, discussing the need to adapt to climate-related flooding. And you will know about this risk all too well given your proximity to the Bay of Fundy and the Minas Basin. And then in August, as if we needed any more proof, the IPCC, 200 of the world's top climate scientists, offered up yet another terrifying warning that we are on borrowed time, calling this code red for the climate. 
and sounding the alarm that we need to wean ourselves off of fossil fuels as quickly as possible. This is an ecological crisis, and I emphasize this point for all of you. It is just as equally a human and social justice crisis and a civilization threat. And due to inaction, we have locked ourselves into a different world than the one that you and I have come to know. But we can still prevent this world from becoming uninhabitable. So based on the um, research that Seth has done, Seth Klein, who wrote the book, and the work of the Climate Emergency Unit, there's a few markers of how you can measure your municipal action in terms of addressing the climate emergency. First, you need to spend what it takes to win. This year in response to the COVID emergency, Canada's debt to GDP ratio will raise to 50%. At the end of World War II, it was over 100%. And when C.D. Howe, the minister who oversaw Canada's wartime military production, was pressed about government spending, he famously replied, if we lose the war, nothing will matter. The same goes with the climate crisis. Some ways you can make sure you are spending what it takes to win municipally is to create a carbon budget so that you know every year how much you need to reduce your greenhouse gas emissions by, and then if your, bud your financial budget isn't helping you reach that goal, reassess your budget. Add a climate lens to every budget decision you make and divest from fossil fuels. If your municipal funds and staff pensions are endowments or endowments continue to invest in fossil fuels, they are at risk. Reallocate funds from greenhouse gas intensive projects to greenhouse gas reduction projects. What, is, what are some potential sources of revenue? Consider a climate levy on your property tax. You can make it more progressive and less challenging for those who live in poverty by adding income brackets. Vancouver recently adopted a climate levy. Halifax is looking at it. You could also examine green bonds. I know municipalities are more financially constricted than the provinces and the federal governments, but you have a lot of jurisdiction over climate action, so it's important to figure out how you can increase your revenue to spend what it takes. Create new institutions to get the job done. During World War II, starting from a base of virtually nothing, the Canadian economy and its labor force pumped out a volume of military equipment that is simply mind-blowing. During those six years, Canada, with a population of less than one-third of what it is today, produced 800,000 military vehicles, more than German, Germany, Italy, and Japan combined, 16,000 military aircraft, and remarkably, the Canadian government established 28 crown corporations to meet the supply and munitions required for the war effort. What does that look like for you? I recommend that you create a regional climate director, which maybe you're already looking into, but you do need to have at least one staff person, probably many more, that are addressing the climate challenges that you face in your region and in your municipality. This person needs to have enough power to be able to respond, to be directly tied to the CAO. I've too often seen climate, um, climate jobs allocated to new and recent uh, interns recent graduates that just don't get the trust and respect of an older uh, an older employee. So I really encourage you to hire someone with experience or at least someone that you can trust. Uh, so and also we need to move from incentive and voluntary action to mandatory action. So this is the third marker. We know, I just want to remind us again about the IPCC report and the International Energy Agency, both which were released this year, both these reports saying we need to phase out fossil fuel infrastructure. There's no more time left. We cannot invest in new infrastructure for fossil fuels. Currently, we encourage change, we incentivize change, we offer rebates, we send price signals, but what we have decidedly not done is require change. And this is true for almost all municipal climate policies. We can't incentivize our way to victory. Things you can do is in our implement a net zero building code. I know you need to work on the province with that it's a provincial mandate, but you can pressure the province to implement a net zero building code. Make sure that no new builds uh, or include on-site fossil fuels like oil. At this point in 2021, almost 2022, no new builds should include oil. Any cars you buy for your municipality should be electric. Telling the truth is the fourth marker. It took leadership to mobilize the public during World War II. In frequency and tone, in words and in action, emergencies need to look and sound and feel like emergencies. 
During COVID, we heard from the province and the federal government almost every single day. You can't have a good emergency mode policy at any level unless you have a very good communications campaign. And finally, there's two more markers which we didn't do a great job of hitting during the Second World War, but are essential to the climate crisis. We need to make sure that we leave no one behind. We know that the housing crisis touches almost all vulnerable demographics. We know that energy poverty is experienced by one of, at one of the highest rates here in Nova Scotia. And I see I'm coming to the end of my time, so I'm just gonna say in implementing equity policy with climate policy is essential, and I can answer more questions about it. Thank you. Excellent. Uh, Emma, you had uh, 10 seconds left. Well done. Are there any questions uh, for, uh, for Emma? No questions? Well, we have your video. Thank you very much. And the presentation will be circulated uh, to uh, all members uh, of, uh, of council. And uh, if there's any of our citizens uh, looking for that, it will also uh, be on our network. Uh, so thank you very much for your presentation this evening. Thank you. Have a great evening. Thanks. You too. All right, our next presentation is uh, the Kentville Ravine and with uh, tree vaccines and Thank you, Mayor Snow, and welcome, or thank you for having me today. I'm a little nervous. I've never spoken before council before. Um, <laughs> so give me some grace, but I'm excited to talk with you today about um, the Kentville Ravine and what we are looking to do in order to protect its future. So my name is Christiane Hagerman. I'm a biologist by trade, and I'm also a concerned citizen. Um, Go to the next slide, sure. So I'll just inform you a little bit about hemlock woolly adelgid. This is, um, it's an aphid. It's originally from Asia. It first appeared in Nova Scotia in 2017. And we know that it's invasive because we've seen its effects on the trees in the United States, specifically in the eastern board there. Um, this is an insect that multiplies very rapidly and it feeds on the base of hemlock needles. This drains a tree completely of its nutrients. It can take somewhere around four years for you to see its effect on an entire forest, but essentially it kills the tree and there's no, there's no predator that's present in the environment here in Nova Scotia or in really this side of North America to mitigate it. So this causes a, a serious threat to our forests, but specifically to the Kentville Ravine. Um, concerning spread, this is a pest that can spread through wind, through animals, touching their feet on <laughs> those little cobweb-looking structures there. Those are egg sacs. Um, and it can also be spread by people who maybe just entered a forest somewhere where the pest was present and unknowingly tracked it into a new forest where it wasn't present. Okay, I'll talk a little bit about what this looks like for our community here in Kentville and in Nova Scotia on a whole. Um, the Kentville Ravine specifically is an old growth forest and hemlock is the dominant species that we see in its forest. These old trees are important carbon converters. Um, they're much more efficient at removing carbon from our atmosphere than the younger trees would be. Hemlocks are also an important water filtering species and their roots prevent erosion um, and thus flooding like we would have seen in BC in the past month or so. Um, these trees are locking in the water when we get big downpours and so their loss will impact that as well in our community. Um, hemlocks are also an important sign of biodiversity um, they're a habitat for other old growth species such as um, uh, the rare downy rattlesnake plantain, which I believe has been confirmed in the Kentville Ravine, um, important lichens, and more rare and threatened species like birds and bats and owls and even flying squirrels. 
Um, the microclimate that's provided by these trees keeps wildlife cool. It also keeps us cool in the summertime and it keeps um, that habitat warmer in the winter time by locking in heat. So <laughs> the reason why I'm here to talk to you today um, is that we have several options in order to mitigate this issue. Um, one option is to inject them individually with a chemical treatment that will kill the pest um, when it does arrive here in Kentville. It isn't here yet. Um, and that is a pesticide, but it's injected inside the tree. And I can answer questions on that later if you wish. Um, another option is to have an integrated approach where we might inject several trees with this pesticide, um, but not all of them, seeing as there are a lot of trees. Um, yeah, and then relying on other alternate methods, um, such as experimental treatments, and then also maybe mitigating some, I don't think mitigating is the right word, but implementing some boot cleaning stations at the front of the park. Um, and then I'll just talk briefly about biocontrol, which is one of these experimental treatments. It's where we bring in another creature to target the pest and hopefully balance out the ecosystem. A third option would be to take no preventative measures and just allow the pest to essentially have its way in our old growth. So I just wanted to present to you the fact that there is an advisory committee that is meeting right currently to discuss this issue and its complexities. Um, we're creating an action plan. We are concerned about the ethical implementation implications of treating the forest with um, a pesticide, and there are multiple experts from academia and even from the Kempel Research Station who are involved in this project and who are assessing the risks that are imposed. Um, we're looking to survey the ravine in order to assess how many hemlock trees there are that will be affected. Um, we're going to be working to recruit volunteers when we do come up with a treatment. Um, we are, well, personally, I am fundraising <laughs> to um, be able to financially, um, <laughs> to be able to financially provide for whatever treatment is chosen by the committee. Um, yeah, and we're also going to be coming up with a timeline for the treatment because the pest hasn't arrived yet, but we do expect that it will arrive sometime in the spring. Um, yeah, we'll be open to some questions now. <laughs> Excellent, uh, Christiane. Uh, six minutes, 29 seconds. Well done. <laughs> so are there, uh, are there any questions uh, for, uh, for Christiane? Councillor Gerard. Just, just one. Um, you had uh, talked about maybe the, the, I think it's the bio, uh, bio bringing, bringing in a, a predator. Yes. Um, do you know what that could be and are there effects on the other end of that? Yeah, so I know that there are several uh, biocontrol agents that are being researched currently. And so that would look more like partnering with research that's already being done or even um, seeing if, if the provincial government would like to provide some sort of biocontrol agent on a whole. Um, but yeah, it is very experimental and yes, there are um, lots of concerns <laughs> because we don't want to end up like New Zealand where there are so many invasive species now because they kept bringing in new species trying to get rid of the old ones. Um, so yeah, it is a complicated issue and it's one that requires more research, but we're hoping we'll see it in, in the near future. And one last question. Do you see perhaps the pesticide working overall or is, is, is saving these trees going to be a combination of Two or three different things. So, oh yeah, I forgot to mention that the this pesticide does um, it only lives inside of the tree for for up to seven five to seven years essentially. So, it will be um, an ongoing treatment that will need to be implicated. Yeah, I hope that answers your question. Yep. Okay. Oh, that's perfect. Thank you. Great. Councillor York. 
Thank you so much for your presentation. I'm wondering if you have any um, studies or reports that show the, um, the results of these uh, vaccines, if they've been done in other areas across the country or in, in North America, and if we would have access to those, if you could send them. Yeah, I can point. send them. So there is um, uh, a <laughs> experimental, I guess it wasn't experimental because this is really the recommended treatment by the government right now. Mm -hmm. um, but there was a similar project that was done at, uh, it's called Sporting Lake Nature Preserve in Kejimukujik National Park. Um, yeah, and they're seeing that it's, it's been quite successful so far. It was just done, uh, I think, a few months ago. Great, thank you. Yeah. Councillor Huntley. Thank you. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you um, as well. I have two questions. Sure. One is, what is your fundraising goal? Um, so currently, the fundraising goal is ten thousand okay. dollars, and we are nearing the halfway mark right now. Wow! Um, I have it here. Yeah, that's the GoFundMe page, mm -hmm. um, <laughs> which has been very exciting for me because I wasn't really sure what kind of response the community would have. But these are people from all over the province and even throughout the country, which is nice. great. That um, it seems like people are putting the focus here on Canfield. Um, so yeah, that's the goal. Um, ultimately, it would not be enough to treat all of the trees. There are, there are thousands of hemlock trees in the Kenville Ravine. Um, yes. So it, yeah. <laughs> and would you have um, an example? So on one of the slides there, it talked about what if we did nothing? So is there an area that you can speak to? Okay, yeah. this country did <laughs> nothing in this area and this is how long it took the trees to die. Yeah. Um, I have been looking for studies that say how long it took the trees to die. Yeah. It looks like more of the studies are more broad. Oh, yes. Um, but they are saying that within four years, they do see like significant canopy decrease in at least 25% of the forests. Oh, wow. um, this is a photo that I found today of, um, of hemlock forests in the Appalachians in the United States. Um, as you can see, the results are quite profound. Mm. Yeah. Thank you. Welcome. Councillor Maxwell. Thank you. Um, thank you, Christiane. I was at the, the committee meeting and uh, I wanted to thank you for, for chairing this group. I think you're, it, it will be an amazing, amazing group. Um, I just wanted to, to let council know how impressed I was with the professional backgrounds of the people that are sitting on that committee right now. Um, very, very diverse, very, very well educated in, uh, in, the, in these issues from the research station from Acadia University. Um, it just, just amazing. And I think that this committee will probably come up with, with something uh, really good, a really good uh, solution well, for the town. Well people. informed, yeah. Well informed. I agree. Yeah, thank you very much thank for you. what you're doing. Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, thank you for your presentation. Job well done on thank first you. time speaking to the council. It was excellent. Um, so I guess my question would be, you know, you talked about your goal being 10,000 and you're about halfway there. Um, uh, I'm sure you're with the committee looking at respective grants and other opportunities there, but how can, how can we as the town of Kempville help you? Or maybe that's been covered off in the meeting. Councillor Maxwell, I know attended, I wasn't able to, but. Yeah, I think the hopes are that in the future, um, now that you know this is an issue, mm. um, as soon as we come up with an action plan, we'll be able to present that plan to you and you'll be able to say how you can help us. Okay. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, in the meeting this week, we didn't come far enough to come up with okay. <laughs> the, the <laughs> issue. We had to get all the cards on the table. Sure. Um, but we're meeting again this Wednesday. Wonderful. So, yeah. Well, very worthwhile. So. Thank you for thank your you. tenacity with us. Thank you very much. No, thank you. All right. Thank you very much for your presentation. Okay. Thank you, Mayor Snow. Mayor Snow, your comments on the topic are very, very quick ones. Uh, uh, no, uh, we, we don't, but thank you for, uh, for asking. Okay. And our next uh, presentation is uh, Pat Norton with uh, Vaccines. I understand rightly that we're allowed to take our masks off when we speak or no? No. Okay. Council um, is because we're seated. Oh, because you're seated? Yes. <laughs> I see. Okay. Well, I'll stand and keep my mask on. 
Good evening, Your Worship, and uh, friends, neighbours, uh, members of the Town Council. I'd like to thank you very much for making time on your busy agenda this evening for myself and my friend Scott Fraser, who uh, prepared the slides and who will be available to help answer questions. Um, I, uh, I um, hope you've received already preliminary materials that I sent you last week. And um, because, you know, this is such a big topic, I, I can't possibly do in 10 minutes what I prepared to deliver. So you've been given the text of my presentation tonight, so I will just highlight some of those things. And I think I'd best jump right in. So my topic, if I can have the first slide. Oh, am I supposed to do that? Okay, well, Scott, you do. Okay, so my topic is, how do we as a community provide the best long-term care and safety for our children in COVID times and beyond? Our children. Is there anything more precious to us in this world than our children? And I think we would all agree our most sacred duty on this earth is to provide care and protection for our children. COVID, you know, uh, 20 months ago, you know, we went from two, two weeks to flatten the curve through masks, through lockdowns, through uh, homeschooling, through social distancing, all that, being encouraged to believe that maybe with just this one more thing that we'd get our lives back. It, it, it felt to me almost like we stepped onto one of those moving sidewalks that you see in airports. And, you know, we stepped onto that and woof, in no time at all, we were far away from anything that we'd ever known and we'd ever been. And I'm just suggesting it may be time for us to stop and take stock and reclaim some agency in our lives. We've just sort of been moved along. And I think this is particularly important since children are now the new focus. And we have now vaccines available for five to 11 year olds. And the way one thing that has led to another, I can't help but wondering if this will then become vaccinations without parental consent and possibly mandates. So I'm offering myself here tonight as the uh, 10th man, the loyal dissident. And this is a little known, but I think very valuable concept that is employed in groups sometimes um, when there is danger of groupthink. And any psychologist will tell you that that can happen very easily, and any historian will tell you that that leads to very disastrous consequences. So the role of the Tenth Man and the loyal dissenter is to respectfully present um, alternative information and, you know, opposing points of view, just to avoid a group think. So I would like to share with you some information that I've garnered over the past 20 years, having perused many studies, read a number of books, and just keeping in touch with what's going on. This is information that you will not get in the CBC, and you will not get in the daily briefings, and you will not get in the Chronicle Herald. So first of all, we know that the, the uh, pandemic is case-driven. So it's, it's about how many cases. A case is someone who scores positive on a PCR test. A PCR test, as used, yields 97% false positives and cannot distinguish among cold, influenza, COVID, pneumonia. So what we need to understand when we hear 100 cases is there are, in fact, probably three cases. And in those three cases, they may even be all asymptomatic. So that's... I wanted to start with good news. So there's good news, um, more good news. Uh, as as uh, viruses mutate, they become less lethal. More good news. Doctors around the world have by now been extremely successful in finding alternative uh, ways to deal with, with COVID. There are other treatments available. What about the risk to children? Because my topic is specifically children. Children have suffered enormously through all this. All studies show that they're falling behind educationally, they're find, falling behind emotionally, they're falling behind socially. In every way, they're falling behind. So here's more good news. 
the survival rate of the zero to 19 year old age group is 99.997%. This is without vaccines. That's not 99.997% of children in that age group. That is of all the children in that age group within that tiny portion that might actually get um, COVID, most likely asymptomatic or mild, 99.997% of them survive. Statistically, there is a 0%, when you do your rounding, there's, there's a little bit, but statistically, it easily rounds to 0% chance of mortality for children with COVID. In Sweden, in the first year of the pandemic, with no masking, no social distancing, no lockdowns, no school closures, they lost not one of their 1.8 million children. Children have magnificent immune systems and they are well equipped to deal with COVID without the intervention of a vaccine. And it's critically too important to remember too that these are developing immune systems. A child in his early years, and I'm thinking specifically of these little ones, five to 11, are laying down their immune system, which is intended to serve them for their lifetimes to face an array of illnesses. We don't want to start specializing it at the age of five to, to be, you know, hyper alert for um, one particular pathogen. And, and this is what has been shown to be happening. We, we must preserve and safeguard our children's immune systems. Their best bet for a long-term healthy future is their own immune system. And it is surely our our duty and responsibility to do everything that we can to protect these children. What about risk to others? I would be, for instance, in the category of the vulnerable that, that we need to vaccinate all these children to protect. If we look here again, even me, one of the most vulnerable, my chance of surviving if I get COVID is 99.5%. That's okay by me. I don't want any child anywhere being subjected to any risk to bump that up to 99.6. And as somebody who's retired, I'm, I'm very well positioned to, to, to take the precautions I need to take. So the onus I feel is on me and um, I, just, I just think we all need to think like, please, please, can we, can we just leave the children be? So we need to ask the question then, do, do vaccines themselves present any uh, danger to the children? Well, I think the answer we would have to say is yes. This is VAERS data, Vaccine Adverse Event Reporting System in the United States. So, uh, and, this, and this, I just got this this morning. Childhood deaths. Childhood deaths by COVID vaccines are now nearly twice the number of childhood deaths of COVID. And this is more likely the childhood deaths of COVID, more likely childhood deaths with COVID. Because even if COVID is, is present, we saw a case in Alberta, a 14 year old boy died of brain cancer and it was, it was loudly pronounced across the airwaves as the youngest person yet to die of COVID until his family corrected that message and said, no, he died of, of, of stage four brain cancer. But anyway, even assuming that it was 757 COVID deaths, that is, that is uh, just over half of the number of children who are dying from um, COVID vaccines. Um, Julia was child 1,312. I don't know who Julia is, but Julia was somebody's cherished daughter. Um, COVID vaccines are known to cause myocarditis and pericarditis. Those are two extremely serious heart conditions. And as you can read, very serious. Ontario, the first Canadian province to roll out COVID vaccines for children has already reported its first case of myocarditis in the five to 11 year old age group. There are no mild cases of myocarditis as Dr. Strang suggested when reporting on a Nova Scotian child who became ill with myocarditis. There's little data to date on uh, five to 11 year olds specifically because we've only just started um, vaccinating them. 
but moving up to the next age court, age cohort, and again uh, from bears, which is known to capture as little as one to ten percent of the adverse effects. As of September fifth this year, among six to seventeen year olds, I'm reading from my script now, not here. Uh, there have been fourteen deaths, seventy three children became blind, forty eight who became deaf after receiving the COVID vaccination. Can you imagine if you took your healthy child for a vaccination against uh, an illness that presented virtually no risk that would occur and having your child become blind or die? Thank you, Pat. That's your, uh, your 10 minutes. Okay, well then can I switch so to the last slide? Thank you. Uh, thank you for, uh, for your presentation. And uh, I see we have some questions uh, from members of, uh, of council. Councillor York. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I can hear from your presentation that you're afraid and you're concerned, and I appreciate that. I do. Uh, and I know realistically that I am not going to change your mind this evening about the safety of vaccines. However, um, it would be irresponsible of, irresponsible of me, given my platform um, that I have here, to not reiterate that the overwhelming medical and scientific evidence and consensus proves that vaccines are good and they're safe and they're effective for both children and adults. Um, you did point to Sweden as an example of um, how they didn't need vaccine mandates, um, but I would be remiss if I also didn't mention that Sweden sits at about an 83% vaccination rate without the mandates, uh, and that is likely why they haven't required them. Um, like you, I am not a medical professional and I do not have a PhD in epidemiology, um, but it is my opinion that vaccines work. Um, vaccines keep communities safe, they keep um, children safe, and they prevent death and serious il illness. And uh, given the update from the province today about the safety of our children in schools and communities at large, I know there are many people in town tonight who are also afraid and who are also concerned um, because their children haven't yet been able to be fully vaccinated. Uh, and I do want to reiterate that this is no joke, that vaccines are safe, they are effective, and our children need to be kept safe from, um, from a virus that is lethal. Thank you. Thank you. Will you ask me to respond to that? Uh, you can if you wish. I am not asking. Respond to it. Yeah, I thought that that was a question. Um, maybe then, um, you know, this is what I'm asking of the town council. And maybe, you know, looking at my third ask here, striking a committee to monitor and respond to COVID exigencies as they arise, a committee which will include citizens and councillors with diverse points of view, Maybe, maybe that would be a good idea because um, I think, as I indicated in my preliminary materials, I am 100% convinced that everybody is working with good heart and good intent and wants the best health and wellness for our children and our, for, for our community. We are, we're drawing from very, very different um, streams of information and, and it's a, it's a it's a disagreement between information, not a disagreement between people. And I would, I think, feel it was really helpful to bring people together, recognizing we all want the same thing, and then, you know, with an open mind, look at the information and, uh, and, and come to some decisions. Thank so you. Councillor Maxwell. Thank you. Um, I will echo some of what uh, Councillor York has said. Um, when I make my decisions, I have great respect for history, um, being a teacher and uh, coming from that background. And I look at history, and if I can't make a decision, I go back in history, and I find that there were a lot of diseases, not just childhood diseases, but diseases that affected our adult population um, that caused death, that caused disability, and vaccines were what eradicated many of those. Now, I look at the difference between then and now, and I say, well, now we have the internet, which is full of misleading information, that you can get it from just about anywhere. The difference then was that people observed family members dying, 
coming up with dis having you know lifelong disabilities but they didn't have misleading information they didn't have the vaccines they had to sit and they had to watch all that destruction then vaccines came along and people were basically wanting those vaccines they wanted to stop polio they wanted to stop diphtheria they wanted to stop scarlet fever they didn't want their family members to go through those types of diseases and thank god we were able to come up with vaccines to do that then i jump forward to today and i say well, what do we have today today we do have technology which isn't all bad and so we have scientists now that can work faster um, more efficiently in greater communication with scientists around the entire world and they can come up with vaccines faster and more effectively and we are fortunate today that we don't have to sit and watch the devastation that this virus possibly could do if nobody was vaccinated if we just let it run rampant through our communities and so history in my opinion helps us make important decisions because we can look at what was done wrong and we can look at what was done right my mother's 98 years old and she's in a nursing home and i'm there every day with her twice a day and i don't think she's any less valuable than a five-year-old and she's not a disposable human being and yet some of the presentations maybe not necessarily yours but some of the things that i've heard of make it seem like she's disposable she's lived long enough and so she's disposable we can let her go and we you know we're not going to protect her we're just going to let it run rampant through nursing homes and we've seen that happen haven't we we've seen nursing home uh, with the virus run rampant in halifax and now up in amherst area and so on and many people's parents like my mom passed away and i might be very happy with my 90 whatever percent if it's accurate um, but i'm not happy with my mother being exposed to a virus unnecessarily because somebody doesn't believe that the science behind it is important and you know i really feel very much like we need to look at our history we need to look at where we've come from and where we're going and i'm very passionate about this i don't care if people make their decision not to be vaccinated i don't care that's their personal decision but i also have a right not to be exposed to this virus unnecessarily and then expose my mother or anybody else in my community to this virus. I believe in science because science has brought our humanity this far. And I think that if there was something wrong with this vaccine, then there would be people speaking up all over the world about it. And yet this is the one thing that every country, whether they be democratic, communist, autocratic, whatever, they all agree. There's no country standing up and saying, uh, vaccines, no, no, we don't want them, we don't want them in our country. They're all clamoring for them. They want them, every single country in the world. It's not a conspiracy to have Russia in the, on the same lane as the United States or Canada when we're all fighting the same virus. We're all trying to get through this. And we don't have all the answers. We know that. I didn't think for a minute once we got going that this was gonna be a short-term thing. We're gonna live with this until we get the entire world vaccinated. That's, we're gonna live with it. And I didn't think for one minute back a year and a half ago that I was going to wear a mask, social distance, and everything was going to be great next year. 
But I'll tell you right now, I feel really good about being vaccinated, having my mom vaccinated, and this year she can come home and have Christmas dinner with us because it might be the last Christmas dinner she has. Was that a question? No, I'm not asking you any questions. I'm telling you where I'm coming from because you're telling me where you're coming from. Oh, and so as much as I listen to you, you can listen to me. Thank you very much. Councillor Huntley. Uh, thank you for your presentation to us. Um, I just wanted to say there is no question here. Uh, this is only my point of view. It's not the town. It's not, I can't speak for counselors. I back the vaccine. I thank God every day that it was created. I look at how hard the countries are trying to help their residents survive and live through this. I would like to thank all the medical doctors, the scientists, the medical professions, health providers who are working their guts out over the past two years to try and help us. And if I didn't trust them, I wouldn't go to a hospital if I was sick. So it's just a point of view. I know that is your point of view and I respect that. And uh, thank you for listening to me. Was that a question? No, no thank questions. You. Thank you. Um, Thank you again, Pat, Scott, for your presentation. We have uh, your last slide uh, with uh, your request. I will say that uh, we, uh, we have COVID on our agenda when we go in camera, so there will be a discussion at that time and anything that comes out will be made public uh, afterwards. So thank you very much for your presentation this evening. All right, now we've got some, uh, some maneuvering to do here, moving uh, the giant head out of the way and uh, getting our solicitor to, uh, to his chair. No, I wasn't talking about you. <laughs> <laughs> it was Emma was our big giant head tonight. All right, the directors have provided their reports for our review and are present if there are questions. CEO Trope, could you please introduce our department reports and recommendations? Uh, thank you, Mayor Snow. So this evening, as we always do, we'll start off with our uh, finance folks and Director Kroll. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, Good evening to you all. It's great to be here to bring you some information of a financial nature for the month ended uh, November 30th from the Finance Department. We're first turning our eyes to the operating fund. Um, we're looking at the benchmark being 67.7% if everything was averaged evenly over the year. Uh, revenue at the end of November exceeds the average at 89.0% recorded. Taxes remain uh, reporting at 100.4%, which is great news. We're still under the payments in lieu of tax. We're still waiting for the province grant in lieu to arrive. We have heard no word on that, but it has been filed. Uh, services to other governments, 100% of the current year's cost sharing has been invoiced to the County of Kings regarding the Kentville Library. Under financing and transfers revenue, we're reporting it at 100% as all the budgeted transfers from reserve have been transacted at this time. Under expenditures, expenditures are slightly above the benchmark at 70.9% expended. Uh, protective services under firefighting exceeds the benchmark as the third quarter operating fund funding was paid to the Kentville Volunteer Fire Department, along with the final half of the area rate funding, which was collected through taxation. As well, the town paid the water utility for its share of the hydrant area rent. Debt charge in many of the uh, segments is, exceeds the benchmark, but reflects the debt repayment schedule. Under transportation services, public transit exceeds the guideline as the third quarter funding has been forwarded to King's Transit Authority. Uh, solid waste management under environmental health services uh, exceeds the benchmark as the third quarter payment has been made to Valley Waste 
Resource Management Authority. Do you mind if I take my mask off? I'm finding it hard to. Go ahead. <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> I'm breathing this thing down my throat. <laughs> Um, under recreation services, facilities exceeds the threshold due to the expenditures on the swimming pool and various parks throughout the town. And under financing expenditures on the expenditure side of the ledger, principal exceeds the benchmark but reflects the debt repayment schedule. Under the summary of outstanding taxes, which is Schedule C, the final tax levy, of course, was due October 1st, 2021. The current year's tax levy outstanding at November 30th is $93,008 or 99.0% collected. And this compares to last year's figures, the percentage of 98.6%. Total property tax outstanding as at November 30th is $94,686,000 as compared to last year's figure of $151,034. This equates to 99% collected in total as compared to last year's percentage of 98.4%. Schedule Z and F are the Perpetual Investment Fund. You can see at the bottom of page three the investments and the cost versus market value that we have invested in that fund. Um, at, at October 31st, uh, this is for the month of October 31st, uh, interest paid into the fund is $53,188, dividends paid into the fund $125,965, and capital losses are $8,185. Management fees for the month of October, to, uh, the total met from April to October 31st, $21,745. Um, under Schedules G, which is the Capital Investment Plan, um, at the date of writing, um, $1.26 uh, million has been uh, expended. This is 55.4%. And that concludes the report from the Finance Department for the month ending November 30th, 2021. Excellent. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Director Kroll. Are there any questions uh, for the Director with regards to this report? None? All right. Moving on to your projection report. Uh, yes. Thank you, Your Worship. This is the uh, third projection report for this fiscal year. Uh, revenue was increased very slightly in this report by $1,700, and it purely relates to some own source revenue collected by the, poli the police service. Uh, we're looking at the projected increase in total revenue for the year uh, sitting at uh, $232,000 um, over its budget. Um, on the expenditure side of the ledger, we have uh, expenditures increased $45,700 in this third projection report. Uh, general administration is up $21,600 increase in uh, various legal expenditures. Uh, fire protection is down $9,200 from last report. The Kentville Volunteer Fire Department returned a part of uh, the 2021 uh, surplus that uh, the town funded in the previous year. Um, other protection is down $6,000, and this relates to animal control. At this time, there hasn't been any charges or any usage in that particular segment, so that was uh, basically cut in half. Under recreation, we've moved that budget up $39,000. Uh, mostly related to facility maintenance and parks in general. So the total increase in expenditures for the year, uh, we expect to be $59,400 over our budget on the expenditure side of the ledger, but we're still projecting a surplus at the end of November um, of $172,600. And that's my report. All right, thank you very much. Are there any questions uh, for the director with regards uh, to this report? Councillor Zabian. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Director Cole. Just wondering with the office expenses over budgeted by the $22,800, um, is there a, are we able to break down how much of that is legal and how much is annual insurance premium for administration or? Uh, that is all legal. That is not the, the legal and audits all in connected. that particular account, but the insurance sits in other, in other accounts. So okay. that would be all legal expenses at this time. Now I have another question and this may be for CAO Troke. If we wanted council to know what the legal, um, expenses were, how would a counselor obtain that information, what they pertain to? Um, it's quite easy for me to come back to council and kind of group them into areas, uh, recognizing counselor that there are certain items within that that I'm not going to be able to speak to you about because of a conflict of interest, but I'm happy to uh, put this into a larger group if you'd like me to report back to council. Sorry, on I just paused for a second. You mean a conflict for me? Is that what you meant? Correct. Oh, I don't, I just want to know what they're for. I didn't mean, if I wasn't inferring that they oh, were Oh, I understood you were looking for a detail break -in. Well, I did, but it, legal, legal doesn't have to be just about me. I know the town has spent a lot of money going at me this year, but I meant in general, 
I meant if we want to know what so the what, expenses. I guess, Councillor, to that point yeah. in the comment that I made, is I'm happy to group these into categories to say this is broadly understanding this town sold a lot of land this year as well. Right. So um, happy to come back to council right. with a breakout of kind of thank the areas. You. I think that's what I wanted as an answer. I don't think I like the way that you threw that at the CAO, but thank you. Are there any further questions uh, for the director on this report? <clears throat> All right, Director, you have another report for us. I do, thank you very much, Your Worship. We're looking at a, re, uh, a small memo uh, that was sent uh, with my reports. Uh, it's Town of Kentville sanitary, su sanitary Sewer Sundry Write-Offs. And the background is as follows, that the arbitration matter regarding the Town Sanitary Sewer Area Service and the Municipality of the County of Kings was settled earlier this year, and the related financial tracks, uh, transactions between the parties took place in mid-October 2021. During the period of the arbitration from the years 2014-15 onward, most sundry invoice from invoicing from the town to the county was affected. There are several old outstanding Kings County accounts receivable uh, sitting on our books of record, which were placed on the quote unquote back burner until the town and Kings worked through the arbitration process. These outstanding balances are not collectible and therefore need to be written out of the ledgers. So for recreation services, we have three amounts from, from 2015-16, an amount of $10,194.56. From 2016-17, $3,945.69. And from 2017-18, $9,844.89 for a total of $23,985.14. And re relates mostly to cost sharing changes between the county and the county county changing its formula and not uh, uh, giving the um, giving the proper information to the uh, recreation director and whatnot so these amounts have been sitting on the books for the, that long related to recreation services um, there's an outlier amount on sewer connection seven thousand five hundred and twenty nine dollars and sixty five cents from the year 2018-19 uh, did not make the arbitration table and therefore it has to be written off um, sanitary, uh, there's another small sewer invoice for, from February 2017 for $2,108.33. It's an invoice that was to be cost share between the town and the county. At the end of the day, uh, it was never paid and we just would like to get it off the books of record. So that uh, is also uh, asked to be uh, written out. So we're looking at a total of $33,623.12 in total. Um, of course, we know that these are housekeeping matters and we need to write the things off and they're uncollectible. This, these three amounts are totally uncollectible. Recreation services, um, the recreation services amounts will be written off to the town operating fund, while the sanitary sewer amounts will be written off to the sanitary sewer area service. So my recommendation is that I recommend to council advisory committee that the sundry receivable amounts in the amount of 30, <coughs> excuse me, $33,623.12 be approved for write-off as noted above and forwarded to town council for ratification. Uh, thank you very much, uh, director. So if we take that recommendation and, uh, and to a motion that CAC recommend to council approval of the write-off of the sundry receivables in the amount of $33,623.12 at the January 31st, 2022 council meeting. If someone could move that, please. Councilor York, thank you. And a seconder? Second. Deputy Mayor, thank you. It has been moved and seconded that CAC recommend to Council approval of the write-off of the sundry receivables in the amount of $33,623.12 at the January 31st, 2022 Council meeting. Is there any discussion on this matter? Councillor Maxwell. Thank you. Um, I don't understand. Um, the bulk of this is recreation services, and I at 23000 almost $24,000. And I don't understand, and maybe solicitor can help me to understand this, in arbitration, was that brought up? Was it discussed? That's, that's a huge amount of money. And do we just take a loss on that? Or where are we going forward with this? Um, are we going to get, ex did we gain anything or is, you know. It was uh, the sanit the arbitration process only pertained to sanitary sewer. Right. So the, there were uh, many outstanding issues between the town and the county that were not paid uh, over in the, the course of very many years. Um, recreation services was one of the 
um, departments that the County of Kings was trying to restructure and right. change its funding formulas for all the municipal units that uh, were involved, that, that their citizens um, used right. basically throughout the Kings County area. Um, and I don't believe that they've ever came, come back with an actual formula to this day. Um, so we build them basically for some, I believe it was administrative type of um, functions that it was agreed that the CEO of the day said we should not probably have billed that. So, but we left it on the back burner because of the issues between the town and the county. And um, we, that we, we basically knew we were going to be writing it off. We just didn't write it off in the years that we probably should have written it off. We just were holding on until we got finished with the arbitration process. Okay, so are we, is that, problem solved now or, or are we going to continue to have a similar problem over the next few years like we're writing we're writing this off for them and just saying well you haven't paid it so we're just going to write it off um, and then we accumulate another 24,000 or, or like how no they're they're paying their uh, the recreation actually their billing their invoice their payments for recreation services have actually been arriving before we've actually been doing the billings so they've been paying in the past a um, couple of years, three years, around $51,000, um, which is basically, we don't know what the number's made up of. We have no idea where, where they come up with the figure. Um, we certainly deposit it and use it towards whatever, <laughs> but anyway. Um, okay, so. so they, they've paid, the, these, are, since 2018, 19, they have been paying about $51,000. Right. So, so I'm wondering, do we just, Drop it. I wouldn't. I wouldn't drop that amount of money. I would keep. I would keep after after them. I would send our, our solicitor after them, uh, or somebody was, to go after them because twenty four thousand dollars is a lot of money. I think if I may it is. speak for, I think our former CAO um, at the time yeah. was in agreement that they were, need to be written off. They just were not written off because we didn't want to poke a stick basically at at the arbitration process that was going on. That I was don't the decision of the day. And yeah. I'm, just, I'm just trying to yeah. get our books cleaned up so that we have these things off our books because they are not collectible. They, we will not get this, this money. Why, why are they not collectible? Because they don't feel that we should have billed them. And uh, the CAO of the day agrees that we should not have billed them. Well, we have a new council and we have a new CAO. And I think that we should relook at this. I, I mean, we're just kind of throwing that money to the wind for no good reason and what are we getting in return we don't even know what they're going to pay us each year so you know i don't uh <laughs> see you. Uh, so from an accounting perspective director kroll is under accounting treatment doing exactly what you're supposed to do with debt when it gets to a certain point point. and so one of the things certainly what we could take from this um and, and i support her recommendations that she's made here tonight uh, I certainly am happy to undertake a additional uh, conversation <laughs> with the county to see from a formula perspective if we can get some satisfaction and what what the gap was, yeah. and if there's any any uh, potential negotiation there. I still think you need to write it off, but is there an opportunity to go back and potentially down the road reverse that if there was some change or consideration? And I'd be happy to take that conversation forward. Yeah, I think that's great, and I, and I also think our recreation director should be involved in that discussion as well because, I mean, she has you're, the you're history. I'd just like to jump in because I'm right. concerned the uh, discussion perhaps has gone too far thus okay. up to this point. Um, so just for the record, I'm not the lawyer involved in the historical discussions with the municipality and mm -hmm. the council that was here before may recall that, um, but I do recall from reports to council that various issues were being addressed and may have been considered in the settlement of that. And so I would suggest that discussion here spread carefully around what may or may not have happened and that if, if council as a whole was uncomfortable with this, that perhaps the CAO could report back, yeah. investigate what's already happened and report yeah. back in yes. camera yeah. around those issues. Because I hear a lot of what the councillor a lot of those questions really are legal in nature right. and uh, and director Cole's in a tough position because 
she can't go very deep. If she mm -hmm. has the answers, I'm not going to let her go very deep in open session <laughs> okay. until that's addressed. Okay. Uh, I like that okay. uh, because I just have a lot of questions about that and I would like, if it was in an illegal agreement, I'd like to know what the agreement was. All right. But, but if I can, um, and so some of these things, I know the CEO is making notes, but I, I'd encourage, right, this is a decision to counsel whether or not it wants to go back and revisit those things and look at them. Um, so one counselor raises it, it, it's a concern in any nature, and then council as a whole needs to make a decision about whether you're going to go back and look at it and bring it forward, or whether you're just, you're going to uh, move on beyond it. Um, and that's for this council to decide. All right, thank you, solicitor. So based on uh, what Councillor Maxwell has, has requested, the CAO will go away, uh, bring back some information, we'll talk about it in camera. And we will, uh, from there, based on uh, your, your assistance from a legal perspective, uh, come out in, uh, with a decision. Councillor Gerard. Thank you, Worship. Um, sort of related, but not. Um, so did you say the, counts, or sorry, the, the county pays about 50,000 plus or minus? Was that per year or total since this? Per year. Per year. And I'll direct this one to you. Do we still surmise that uh, the usership of our recreational facilities is about 70, 30 or 75, 25 county residents, 75 town residents, about 25? Uh, it depends on what you're looking at. And also, we don't collect data for things like trails and parks and things like that. So yeah. our programs generally are between 65 and 75 Okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Is there any further discussion on this matter? Are you ready for the question? The question is on the adoption of the motion to recommend to council approval of the write-off of the sundry receivables in the amount of $33,623.12 at the January 31st, 2022 council meeting. Voting is now open. Voting is now closed, and the motion is carried. Thank you. Thank you very much, Director Kroll. Thank you very much, and if I may, I would wish you all a happy holiday season. Thank you very much, and to you and yours. Um, we need to sanitize. Director Gentlemen, if you're taking off your mask, you have to sanitize the, uh, the mic. I'll just shut it off for the moment. All right. Okay, again, hello again. <laughs> um, for the um, month of November, we have issued 10 uh, building permits with a building valuation of 1.2, almost $1.3 million, which brings us to a year total of uh, $25.7 million worth of development within the town. Next month will be the final year end, which will encompass uh, December's numbers as well. Um, three subdivision applications have been processed. Um, two of the bigger <clears throat> uh, development projects in Canfield are moving ahead uh, quickly. Ryan's Park has really taken off. Um, Miner's Landing, they're finishing up their last uh, pour for the um, um, fourth building. There has been a bit of delay over the last few weeks uh, because of the weather. They haven't been able to get uh, their equipment in there and pour in the rain. Um, but um, we're hoping that that will come to fruition soon. Um, I'm sure everybody's heard that about the affordable housing funding that was announced on National um, Housing Day on November 22nd. Uh, the province announced $6.4 million in investment to build about 200 new affordable rentals in Kinfo, Lance, Halifax, and Cold Harbor. Um, 100 of those units is scheduled to come in as a uh, tiny home development plan for the uh, north end of Kenful, not North Kenful, but the north end of Kenful. Uh, staff has had a few preliminary uh, discussions with the developers in terms of um, 
where it's going to go. Uh, the project is also going to be crossing uh, boundary lines between the, municipal the town and the municipality of King, so it's working with planning staff as well uh, to see how easy our two land use bylaws mesh together. Uh, the business park, I have their written business lands, are all, all the lots are sold. I, I, I do understand that one is closing at the end of this week, but I haven't heard anything to suggest that that's going to be an issue, but that's going to be nice to have that whole file closed. Um, we did have a scheduled variance appeal um, this evening at 5 o'clock. It was the first one that I think this council would have gone through. Uh, but some quick negotiation, I got that too. <laughs> <laughs> the appellate withdrew was his uh, appeal, so um, that, that's a good thing. Um, we're also working on some amendments to the land use bylaw to increase the maximum size of accessory dwelling units um, within single family homes, um, also by allowing them within granny suites and above, um, above garages. Right now, we limit the square footage, the 35% of the square footage of a house up to a maximum of 500 square feet in one bedroom. In light of everything that's happening with housing, we're gonna get rid of that. We're gonna stick with the 80% building code numbers. We're not gonna put any maximum um, bedroom units on it. Um, but we're still working with some language to make sure that when it's sitting as a granny suite, a separate building on the lot, or within a detached garage, that that square footage still remains secondary to the main square footage of the um, of the dwelling. So um, hopefully that will come to council for your consideration in January. So those are the highlights. Excellent. Thank you very much. Are there any questions? And there certainly are. Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Worship. Uh, Beverly, the last comment that you just made about the square footage. Does that have to come is before council? Is it as a first and second reading? Or, yeah, or? it'll be amendments to the land use bylaw okay. um, about accessory dwellings, okay. uh, accessory dwellings, accessory structures that are on the, the lot. Okay. Um, so there's a bit of um, correlation between the two of them. So we're just trying to f fit it to, at the language because we to, to yeah to allow for an increase in in accessory dwelling units. Absolutely. Anyways, okay, yeah. that's great. Thank you, Councillor York. Thank you, Director. Uh, gentlemen, I just wanted to thank you and your department for creatively finding solutions to a housing crisis. So I appreciate that and the efforts yeah. that you're doing. Thank you. Thank you. you. Councillor Maxwell. Thank you. Um, thanks for your uh, report. You're and I have a question that's just my own curiosity. But with the tiny homes, is that um, because government's funding, is that government um, run? In other words, do people apply to the government to get in those, or um, do they apply to the company that's building them, or has that been determined yet? But from what I understand, I'm not sure how that whole housing, affordable housing networking actually works with groups that are getting the government money, building it, and what that correlation is between, um, between applicants getting in. There's some type of application that needs to be provided and finances that, that need to be provided. Um, CAO Troke may have a little more information based, based on his background in housing, um, but certainly, f yeah, we will, I'm, I don't have a, an answer for that. Right. I was just wondering if people <clears throat> ask me how do they, how they apply to get in those, yeah. what, what they do. There'll be an application process, There'll definitely. be something that will be announced, probably. Yep. Yeah, okay, thank you. Certainly, uh, each each program has its own criteria, but it never hurts for a in person interested in trying to get into a unit to go to the actual developer. Um, typically, that developer will maintain a wait list, and even if there are, are units that are within an announced group, sometimes those developers have other units, and it's good to connect people that way. So, thank you, uh, CEO. Thank you, Director Gentleman. Yep. All right, and uh, you have uh, the Community Economic Development Coordinator's report, and CAO, was there anything that you wanted to highlight uh, from that report? And are there any questions? Uh, sure, a couple of quick things, if I could, Mayor. Um, so Center Square has been officially uh, deactivated for the season, so that means that there's more parking available in the area, um, and that the downtown holiday beautification is out. 
Um, of course, there was a few tree displays that were out, but now have been removed because there's been a few vandalism issues there. Um, council is uh, aware and was participating in the unveiling of the Little Thunder uh, mural. I would really like to reach out and appreciate Lindsay Young for all of her efforts. Um, Alan had some uh, health issues during this and there was a lot of changes in scheduling, but she did a great job of putting that together and I really wanted to thank Lindsay for that. Uh, and the planning for the Fire and Ice Festival has started up. So uh, very excited about this and the town is working very closely with KBC around this event. And so there's a few new things that we're working on. So that'll be coming back in future reports. And uh, that's what I want to highlight. Thank you very much. Are there any questions with regards to that report? None? All right, then moving on to Parks and Recreation. Good evening, Council. Um, you have my report in front of you, just a few things to highlight. Um, under Parks and Playgrounds and Trails, uh, Christiane was here to present to you about the Kempel Ravine and the issues with the Woolly Adelgid, which took me two years to learn how to pronounce that. So, <laughs> <clears throat> Jen taught me to think of Adele, the singer, and like doing a little jig, just a little hint. Um, <clears throat> as she said, there is a committee that is meeting. Uh, we have another meeting coming up this week, and I will be bringing back uh, continually updates on that. It is a bit of a hot topic around town, um, and we do appreciate um, community efforts like Christian to uh, bringing this t forward, which is great. The Kenfield Arena, um, just quick to note that given today's update, uh, around all our facilities, we will be reevaluating um, COVID protocols at those facilities. So just to remind people to keep up to date on our social media, uh, you can follow us on uh, on all of those different channels, including RecText, um, but that uh, we respond as quickly as possible when public health asks us to. Under programs, on that note, just under the indoor walking piece, which is always one of our uh, most popular programs because people want to be able to continue to walk and they want to do so in a place where they don't have to wear snow suits to do that. Uh, so just in an effort to kind of expedite everything and keep costs down, we're asking pe people to come in and get passes from us so that they don't have to continually show their vaccines once they enter the facility. Um, we've had well over 100 people come in and get passes, so it is quite a, a popular program. Um, uh, and then on that note, the other piece too is that we have our super happy active family fun time program or shaft that's on Saturday. If you ever want to go and watch just total mayhem, I encourage you to go uh, on Saturdays. This is kind of one of a place where kids just get to run wild with no snowsuits on. So it's quite exciting. But the, the, my point there is that um, between those two programs, we really value our partnership with the credit union <coughs> complex, the rec complex. Um, we do receive 200 hours per year um, free because of our relationship. And, and so we split that between programming, partnerships with KCA school, um, and that is something that is, is quite important to the community, which is one of the reasons why we're able to keep the walking, for example, free of charge. Um, in community events, there's a lot going on. The holidays, hopefully everyone was able to attend that. Um, that was quite fun, and Sando was able to wave at everybody, which is great. Uh, the Kenful Plays event took place on November 20th. Um, this is something that happens annually, where we celebrate play. Um, the Acadia class, uh, community development class put it on as per usual and they had over 200 participants, which was great. But the one thing that was really exciting is that we were able to roll out our Moby mat. So if you were there, you saw these mats that were rolled out in the park and, and that's another way that we're trying to make our programs and parks accessible. So you'll be seeing those um, around everywhere uh, so that regardless of your mobility, uh, you're able to, to enjoy things. Um, the Nature Play and Learn, it's another new program, <coughs> excuse me, um, that, uh, that occurred. There was about 40 community members there and then the newcomers event had 50 community newcomers there. So um, we're really excited about all of the things that we're doing and how popular um, and the great turnout that we're coming and appreciate the support from the community. Um, under uh, council priorities, the accessibility plan is the only update I have and that is that the, your new committee of council did meet. Uh, you have a new chair, Spencer Lang, who's um, pretty awesome. I'm excited that they were able to step up into that role and your, uh, your support in case Spencer can't um, attend is Laurel Taylor, 
who was the chair of the ad hoc committee. So it's quite a group. We meet again this week to get going and put some actions into place, and then they will have a conversation around what they want to achieve within uh, the, the period that you've given them, so three, three years. So it's quite exciting. Um, and then under recreation uh, regional facility, that group continues to meet. You'll, you've seen a lot of consultations going around. Um, I'm sure CIO Troke will have a large update on that, but it is continuing to move forward and emails behind the scenes are furiously going back and forth about how we can uh, come up with a, a good proposal. Um, the last piece that I wanted to mention that isn't in here because of timing, but I'm sure all of you have heard that our facility manager, Kevin Bennett, has submitted his resignation. He has um, taken a position somewhere else. It's a really great opportunity. We're very happy and proud of him. We will miss him a lot and we wish him the best of luck. And also, Merry Christmas and Happy New Year. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Director, uh, for that report. Are there any questions for the Director with regards uh, to her report? Looks like, oh, there we go, Councillor Maxwell. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm hoping Kevin may be listening. But uh, I, I told just him I was going to say his name, so probably. <laughs> I, just, I, just, I just wanted to thank Kevin for uh, all he's done uh, for the Town of Kentville and, and Recreation Department and uh, wish him all the best in his new position and maybe someday we'll see him back. So, maybe thank we you. Will. He still lives here also. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Councillor Zavian. Thank you. Yeah, I just want to echo Councillor Maxwell and thanks uh, to Kevin Bennett as well. And you always hate to see somebody leave that's been here so long. So uh, we wish him uh, best of luck in his new uh, position. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Chief, the floor is yours. <clears throat> Good evening, everyone. Uh, I submitted a number of reports to the Board of Police Commissioners for a November 26th meeting, so they'll be accurate up to the end of the month of October. So I have a brief overview, and if you have any questions at the end, I'll be happy to answer them. So from a financial perspective, I think we're uh, well in hand here from uh, an operating budget perspective. A couple of areas I'm looking at and a little concerned about are maintenance and other costs for the building, as well as vehicle maintenance, uh, because we're un unable to get a new vehicle and maintaining the vehicles has been uh, a little bit more costly than normal, but we'll keep an eye on that for the next number of months. Uh, from a capital perspective, obviously, as I mentioned last meeting, we're going to be over a little bit for the purchase of a new vehicle, I think to about $15,000 in our capital budgeting process. Uh, one of the documents I submit was another account, which is kind of a catch-all account, and there's been no significant change from last month, so no concerns there. Uh, I submitted a bylaw report as well as a calls for service report and really there's no significant changes in the last couple of months with the work that the bylaw enforcement officer has been doing as well as our calls for service. Uh, there's no trends that really have caught my attention I'm concerned about. Uh, that includes statistics that are on the chief's report. Um, of note, I guess officers attended our firearms training last month in October for our carbine rifle, which is in our vehicles. And other than that, there's really nothing significant on my monthly reports unless you have some questions or concerns. Thank you very much, Chief. Are there questions uh, for the Chief with regards uh, to this report? All right. Well, then All right. Thank you very much. Then. All right, Director Bell. I hear things happen in threes. Threes, I don't know. That's for next month. Uh, okay. <laughs> yeah. This is November's report. Uh, good evening, <laughs> Mayor and Council. Um, just under Kentville Water and Sanitary Sewer Area Service, both uh, operationally uh, in the month of November. Uh, was uneventful with, uh, with a few new residential and commercial connections, but no, uh, no operational issues. Um, under Public Works, we were informed on November the 9th that of a strike at the Pugwash Salt Mine, <coughs> owned and operated by Windsor Salt. So fortunately, we had an adequate stockpile of salt uh, to get us through the first few uh, snow and ice events until the contingency plan was released by Windsor Salt, which they did. Uh, their plan was to bring in a stockpile, 130,000 metric tons of salt to the port of Halifax from Quebec, but to cover their added expenses, they're charging about a $20 per ton or 33% uh, premium until stock is replenished at the, at the uh, Pugwash Mine, which uh, now that the strike is over there, uh, but the, the, uh, the, the, the downtime Put them uh, put their stock behind so that salt's reserved for uh, Department of Transportation until uh, 
until it's built back up again. Um, so this has the potential to add an extra 20,000 or so to our snow and ice expenses, if it, uh, depending on how long we are forced to pay this premium. Um, under traffic authority, I met with uh, Nova Scotia Power in November uh, at the approaches of the new bridge to explore some options for improving the lighting um, at both ends of the bridge. It was a productive site meeting with the limited number of options uh, discussed, but uh, once exact locations of poles are determined and clearance to dig uh, granted, we will see some improved lighting on the approaches. We're not allowed to actually put lights on the bridge as it's a, a provincial bridge and they they aren't permitting that, but we can help improve the, uh, the approaches with some new lighting. Um, in January, my department will hire a, an intern graduate uh, engineer on, as a three month uh, term position to assess, uh, sorry, assist with projects, uh, so I'm not, I can speak into the mic, um, such as implementation of the uh, active transportation plan through the green infrastructure grant, um, preliminary, de preliminary design of the Donald E. Hilts connector road extension um, to assist with funding applications and uh, design work for next year's capital works project. Um, so we'll, you know, we'll see how that works out and it may turn into a, a, a second term if, uh, if that's successful. Uh, under projects, the Burke subdivision upgrade uh, is now substantially complete. It looks fantastic and will provide decades of low maintenance operation to the town and, and our taxpayers. Uh, the base lift of asphalt was placed just over two weeks ago and lawn and driveway reinstatement has now also been completed and the residents are from what I hear, are all very happy. Um, as I mentioned before, the sanitary sewer project uh, to switch the Centennial Arena from a pumped system over to a lower maintenance gravity system um, is now complete as of about two weeks ago. And an update on the, on the wooden railway bridge um, that connects the, uh, the trail to the Meadowview area that, uh, that was destroyed by fire is getting closer to seeing its replacement. Um, we will likely see that uh, within the next few weeks, weather permitting, uh, they're gonna be building a pad for the large crane to, uh, to place the, the precast concrete sections. And I guess the only other highlight under my meetings and events, uh, Deputy Mayor uh, Savage and I attended uh, a two day seminar in, uh, in Dartmouth on asset management. It was a conference uh, put on by the AIM network, it was very, uh, very informative and a, and a well, well done conference. And that is my report. Thank you very much, uh, Director. Are there any questions for the Director on this uh, report? Councillor Maxwell. Thank you. Um, thank you for your report. I'm um, just wondering, I took a walk around Burke Subdivision and it, it, it does look fantastic. Um, you, you talked about a base layer yeah. of asphalt. Is there another layer to go on top? Second layer, and, and when, when construction happens this late in the season, we don't like to put down the top right. lift. That's part of the reason. The other reason is we had, you know, eight to 12 foot trenches dug for the new, new deep uh, mains. And uh, you know, they're, even though they compact and, and uh, have you know, great equipment these days, there still can be settlements. Mm -hmm. So if, if there's a settlement that can be repaired in that base lift, uh, presumably, presumably next summer, we'll, we'll uh, put it as a uh, requested item to go in the capital budget to put the top lift down. Because without that, without that top lift, um, the, the curb is higher or the gutter is higher than the pavement. Yeah. So the stormwater doesn't get there until it builds up a little bit, right. but it's a short term, a short term thing until the, uh, till the top lift goes down. So in total, we put down four inches of, of asphalt, two right. and a half. And then the top lift is a, a finer mix that goes down as a smoother wearing surface, but right. is best laid in uh, the warm, warm months. You get right. a better finish. That's what I thought, in the because summer. there's yeah. a little bit of a... Yeah, it's about an inch and a half inch that needs to go half. on, and yeah. a little bump there for the driveways yeah. for the short term, but um, put that down ideally in 2022. Okay, and, and the second thing, I was just wondering about the, uh, the tree lights on the corner of Belcher and, uh, and Oak Dean. Are we going to get those turned on this, uh, this Christmas season, or not? Belcher and Oak Dean, that wouldn't... Uh, can you speak to that, Rachel? Tree lights. Oh, They're yeah. all, the whole tree is covered in lights, put new ones on last year. They never take them down. They never take never them off. They're just not lit? They're just not plugged in. Yeah. Okay. We can... Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Okay. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Are there You're any welcome. further questions for the director? All good. Thank you. Thank you.
All right, CAO, you're up. Uh, so, uh, provincial health order, uh, obviously, uh, council and staff have a COVID-19 policy in place. Of course, the provincial health order, there were some changes occurring today, um, and I haven't had a lot of time to digest them, but I'm, uh, assuming we'll have to take a look at those and see if there's any implications with regards to our next co uh, committee of council meeting. So, obviously, if there's any adjustments to be made, we will, we will do that. Um, uh, the Director Bell talked about the technical work that's going to start with regards to the Donald Hills connector. This is in follow-up to um, Council looking to um, apply for a, an ICIP grant with the province when those become available. So this is kind of getting our legs under us before that application call comes out. Um, the training committee here in uh, Town Hall, we have an amazing number of folks who are sitting on this committee and they've done a comprehensive review of a human resource manual. Uh, I would say it's probably 90% plus complete. I had an opportunity to take a look at it. It's an amazing amount of work by the team um, and a lot of really good stuff, making sure that we're, we're modernized with regards to our, to our human resource policies. The tracking system uh, I spoke of, uh, I think at one of our previous meetings around Access E11, which is now in place, there are some additional enhancements going to be coming over the next number of months, but we're in place now when folks would call in with, um, with a concern or looking for an action, these items are recorded and tracked. So we have essentially a dashboard on timing on how fast things are being turned around, but also going to be enhancing that obviously for internet connectivity. So when folks would email in a request, they'd be getting responses back through the medium in which they would apply. There's some work to be done there, but that's going to be put in place. On the intermunicipal service agreements, uh, we had a conversation earlier uh, tonight in our special council meeting, but I also wanted to mention that there's work also has begun with regards to climate change and diversity amongst the CAOs. And uh, there is uh, a greenhouse gas inventory coming uh, back, um, expected to be just before Christmas. There was the consultant doing some work on regional modeling, and now that modeling is going to be drilling down to the municipal units. So. This is work that then is going to help inform the CAOs when we get together to have those conversations. And the Regional Recreation Facility Study, there's ongoing public consultation and uh, we anticipate that we will have um, the consultants involved in that in doing the presentation for Council, I think in January is, is slated. And I also want to mention for Council, the housing and homelessness work. I know we've been kind of talking about this for some time. The, the number of nonprofits and groups in this community involved is amazing. Folks are all wor working collaboratively. Um, and I have to say, that doesn't always occur in communities, but this is not about turf, it's not about territory. It's about people trying to come together to say there's some challenges, and not just in the housing stock, but also is there certain components of the service delivery that's needed, and how can we be working together, or how can we be working with the province on that and uh, so ongoing meetings coming up uh, actually later this week um, but as a group uh, they're really taking a comprehensive look at the issue of homelessness here in in the entire Annapolis Valley area and a lot of really good work being done so um, that's my report for this evening. Thank you very much CAO. Are there any questions for the CAO with regards to this report? No questions? All right, then we will uh, move on to a motion to accept the staff reports as presented. If someone could move that, please. Mm -hmm. Councillor York, thank you. And a seconder. Councillor Huntley, thank you. It has been moved and seconded that staff reports be accepted as presented. All those in favor? Those opposed? The motion is carried. Thank you very much. As we uh, move through our agenda, you will recall that uh, the unfinished business was moved into the in-camera. So we have, uh, we have no unfinished business. We'll move on to, uh, to our correspondence. And uh, we have, uh, oh, uh, happy, 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 happy season. <laughs> yeah, happy holidays. Um, <laughs> That was pretty uh, crappy. <laughs> All right, we'll get to it uh, later. So we do have a, a thank you uh, from uh, New Horizons uh, for, uh, for their grant. And uh, the other uh, piece of, um, of um, correspondence that will go in the uh, 
Um, the network for you is uh, from the Municipal Affairs and Housing with regards to uh, Municipal and Village Code of Conduct relations, uh, regulations. And uh, so a committee has been stood up, although they have not met yet. Um, the intention is to start the meetings in 2022. So that is uh, our correspondence. Uh, we do have uh, new business and uh, you have been provided uh, with the 2022 Council and CAC meeting dates. Um, CAO, was there anything that you wanted to add to uh, this note? Uh, I don't have anything to add at this note, but if there is any uh, conflicts that we've missed in that, I uh, certainly uh, would uh, be pleased to hear if there's any of the meetings would need to be adjusted if there's a conflict for uh, if we missed a holiday or something along the way, please let us know. All right, so uh, you have uh, you have the proposed uh, schedule. Uh, so our motion from that would be that CAC recommend approval of the 2022 Council and CAC meeting dates to Council for consideration at the January, 20, January 31st, 2022 meeting of Council. If someone could move that. Councillor Maxwell, thank you. And a seconder. Deputy Mayor, thank you. It has been moved and seconded that CAC recommend approval of the 2022 Council and CAC meeting dates to Council for consideration at the January 31st, 2022 meeting of Council. Is there any discussion on the matter? Are you ready for the question? The question is on recommendation of approval from CAC to recommend approval of the 2022 Council and CAC meeting dates to Council for consideration at the January 31st, 2022 meeting of Council. Voting is now open. <laughs> Voting is now closed. And the motion is carried. Thank you. All right. Uh, we, uh, we are now uh, at uh, public comments. And uh, for our members of the gallery, if you wish to address the council, please step to the mic. You will have two minutes. Uh, you may remove your mask, uh, state your name, and uh, your address, please. Hello, it's Patricia Williamson, 10 Layton Street, Kentville, Nova Scotia. Um, I had concerns regarding the buyback of the Robinson property and how that's going to affect legal costs for taxpayers. And if there is a new contractor ready to purchase the property or is it going to be laying vacant? Um, I just think it's unfortunate that we're losing a development in Kentville that could have been so viable. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Good evening. I'm going to try to set this down and not uh, put it on top of the keyboard. Um, Mark Rogers, uh, 427 Park Street, Kentville. Two very quick um, things I just want to mention. Um, first off, my point I wanted to raise earlier, and I totally appreciate and understand uh, the mayor's ruling on that. Um, it was quite striking during the, the talk about the Kentville Ravine and the hemlocks, the last picture of all of those dead hemlocks. And I thought for a moment, that is a huge, excuse my mask keeps slipping, huge fire hazard in our backyard if that ravine ever, ever, ever goes that extent. So I just wanted to point that out. Um, I've got a bit of a background on this. I spoke to the presenter. I'm going to catch up with, the, with Councillor Maxwell and Councillor uh, Savage at some point to see if there's something I can do to assist with anything moving that forward. Um, my last second comment, quite quickly. Um, I'm a huge proponent, a huge fan of democracy. Um, it's not the best system we have. Uh, it's not the best system out there, but it is the best one we have um, at this present time. And, and democracy um, works when people's voices are heard and, and appreciated. And um, an example um, is the microphone, which is red tonight, which I really appreciate. Um, and, uh, and I appreciate the apology on that because people's voices do contribute to, to making hopefully our town better. And we're not going to always agree, of course not, because we're humans. Um, but I think the fact that, uh, that differing voices can build a consensus that makes our town more powerful. Um, a second example of that is uh, effective use of, this mask is driving me nuts. <laughs> I guess I could take it off, but I'm cognizant of uh, 
of the COVID um, is effective use of rules of order. Um, a lot of people, I've, I've, I've chaired many, many, many meetings, and people say, I don't want to use rules of order. They stifle conversation. No, they don't. They allow conversation. They allow even debate. They allow a process to follow through. So as an example, um, every motion or amendment to a motion or an amendment to an amendment to a motion um, must have room for debate because you can't simply put something out there and then vote on it without giving rationale or pros and cons to that. Um, without discussion or debate, democracy is stifled. We don't have to agree with each other. That would frankly be boring. Um, but, but we do have to respect uh, other people's opinions. And the third thing I want to mention to that, <clears throat> excuse me, sorry, is the amount of time to speak into motions. Roberts' rules of order, Borneau's rules of order, whichever you use, all have time limits to speak it, to speak to motions. That is there so one, one person can't control the amount of discussion going on, and they say, oh, well, I'm going to use an example. Councillor Gerard, he spoke for 10 minutes. Must be really important. I'm going to, no. Everybody gets three minutes or whatever quantum is used within those rules, and uh, that allows for a balanced debate. Um, and I think that's uh, where I'm going to wrap that up. As I, I'll, just in closing, democracy can be messy, but, but it is what we have. It's what we must use. Um, and I think all of us have a very important role in making democracy work. I appreciate uh, council and mayor allowing me time to, to uh, make a presentation. And I also wish you all the best in the holidays and uh, look forward to hopefully a uh, uh, somewhat calmer 2022. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Right. Thank you, Mark. Good evening, everyone. My name is Miriam Zabian, and I live at 40 Anderson Boulevard. Um, so I just wanted to talk about how I've lost faith, and I think I speak for a lot of people in the way that things are run within council. Um, you know, you hear from other people that they've received, they've sent emails, either nobody sent a reply or the reply regarding decision making was because they lost faith. But to be honest with you, we lost faith. The citizens of Kempville lost faith in this council. Each one of you were elected to do a, your job. And all I see is little children fighting and using their own personal agendas to basically get at each other. Instead of really thinking, hold on, we have a homelessness crisis. So let's take the money that we're gonna waste in legal fees and spend it to, on that. Or housing. Like, why are we wasting money on things that are so, so easy to fix? Why waste it? You're wasting our money. I know each and every one of you are capable of doing such a great job. I know this because I voted for each one of you. And I know you guys have it in you. You guys, and I sent an email two weeks ago as well, and I appreciate for those that did respond. But in that email, I said, one of my points was basically, is it worth it? Is all of this worth it? The humiliation, the way that things have been conducted, the money that was, has been spent so far, lost, gone, could have been spent on children who don't have proper winter gear, who, can't, who don't have proper meals, could have been spent on housing, could have been spent for the homelessness. We don't, we gotta think outside of the box. There was a contract in place, ready to build. Fix the problem. Why, why spend all the money going after something that is already done, it's ready, it's gone? Why spend it out of personal agendas because you lost faith? We lost faith. Kempfel, we lost faith in you. You have no right, any of you, to say you lost faith in so-and-so. 
no right at all. We went through a huge pandemic, still going through a huge pandemic. Unprecedented. Like, I'm still trying to figure out how, where your minds are when it comes to spending our money, fixing infrastructure. But the main thing I'm after is helping the homelessness, providing care for those that need it, for the elderly. I want to know what's being done with those things because we're seeing way too many people on the streets. We're seeing children on the streets. We're seeing children without winter gear. And instead, let's, pe let's spend thousands of dollars on things because we're just angry at each other. Let's just do that, that's easier. I don't care about land. I don't care about any of that. I don't care. You know what I care about? This is making everybody in this town and hopefully around the world being, to be equal, to have a roof over their heads, to be able to have our kids go somewhere, recreation, our complex that every one of you guys promised, which I'm hoping eventually will happen, getting kids active, things like that. I, want, I just want to know what goes through your minds. Because to me and to everybody else, it's a waste. You guys are grown adults. And like I said, I know each and every one of you are capable, good-hearted people, but you, you're just on the wrong path. Your mind has to come back to council and take yourself out of the equation and think about the people of Kempville. That's it. So I hope you guys take that into consideration. Honestly, I didn't get much response in my email, but I really do hope that you guys can just go past this, come up with a plan to work together so that way we can have a better council. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Council has uh, legal and labour matters which must be conducted in a closed session. We require a motion to go into the closed session to discuss the agenda items. We will not be returning to Facebook Live for the adjournment of this meeting. So move into uh, closed session to discuss the agenda items. If someone could move that, please. Deputy Mayor, thank you. And a seconder. Councillor Gerard, thank you. It has been moved and seconded that council move into a closed session. The question is on adoption of the motion to move into a closed session. All those in favor? Those opposed? The motion is carried and the time is um, 7.52. If you